Hey, so Free Grace United, today we are teaching the great book of Ephesians. And I'm standing in the ancient city of Ephesus. The apostle Paul came here. You look at Acts chapter 19 and he started a church here. This town was a town of 250,000. Behind me, you're just looking at a piece of just the library alone. This place housed uh, a temple to Artemis. It was considered one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. It was one of the seven most impressive sites on planet Earth at the time of Paul. In fact, uh, a Greek poet came here and said that this that the temple Artemis here was greater than the pyramids themselves. Now, this place is special. This Ephesus church is special because the apostle Paul started the church here. Then he writes a letter to it, Ephesians, we're gonna study it today. The apostle John ends up here after almost being, boiled after he's boiled in oil, he ends up here and retires here and eventually dies here. Timothy is the pastor of the church here in Ephesus. And Paul writes 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy to him here in Ephesus. And the apostle John writes to one of the seven churches of Revelation is, this, is to the town of Ephesus, which is where I'm standing again. So much of the New Testament comes to the town of Ephesus. And today we get the great privilege of studying one of the greatest books in the New Testament, the book of Ephesians. It's gonna be awesome. Let's get to work. Come on, say Ephesians. You're about to study what I think is the focal point of more of the New Testament than any other book. More letters were written to this spot on planet Earth than any other place. So just high five somebody real quick and say, let's get to work. I'm gonna pray and we're gonna do it. Lord Jesus, thank you for every life. I pray that as we study your word, that you would breathe on the text, Holy Spirit, that you'd bring it to life, that, it would, uh, that the Bible would come to life in such a way that it alters us forever. Everybody say, my heart's open. My mind's ready. Make me better, God. Transform me with your word. Lead me now, Jesus. All God's people said, amen. So we're in book 49 of 66. The author is the apostle Paul. The type of literature is a letter. Come on, say, it's a letter. Uh, the audience, on, on Paul's second missionary journey, he and the pastoral couple, Priscilla and Aquila, that's Acts chapter 18 and 19, came to Ephesus and preached here. I, I, I'm pointing this out because some churches are male-only pastors. And this is a moment in scripture where there's a male and female pastor couple is how Kelly and I uh, model our ministry. We model it after Aquila and Priscilla who are a husband and wife combo who preached in the town of Ephesus. This is, this is how this church began. Uh, and they came to Ephesus and they preached. On Paul's third missionary journey, he took the few believers there and he started a church and discipled them for about two years. That's Acts 19 verse 10. Eventually Timothy pastored here. So first and second Timothy get written to this place. Uh, the Apostle John, his grave is there. You can go to the Apostle John's grave uh, uh, in, in the area of Ephesus, as well as Mary, the mother of Jesus, dies here. So this is where she ends up at the end of her life. There's so much of scripture where the most famous people in the Bible all end up in this town called Ephesus. The setting, Paul was in a Roman prison preaching to those who ha he has led to Christ in Ephesus. Ephesus was a, I must say, cult city. It's a cult city of 250,000. Now, when I say cult city, I want you to understand that it's, pr it's a pretty whack place. Uh, women ruled over men. I, not, not in like women are better than men, but women domineered over men. The women were the warriors, they were the politicians, they were the, they, they were the, they were the officials, they were in charge of everything, and men were basically slaves in this culture. So it's one of those places that was, it was a domineering woman over the top of everybody else. In fact, uh, you probably know, in some sense, you know of this Amazonian culture because they, this is where the legend of the Amazonian woman comes from. Who's ever seen a, a Wonder Woman movie? Guess movie, your hands. The Wonder Woman movies, what do they have? They have a whole bunch of women in charge and they grow up as warriors. And this is the legend of the Amazonian woman, the legend of Wonder Woman comes from this town. In fact, when you're walking through Ephesus, I'll show you a picture. Just jump forward to the slide. So this is, this is the main thoroughfare, uh, 250,000 people living here. This is like one of the government buildings. These are not male warriors, these are all female. It is, it, the, 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 the legend was the women ruled and the men had to be in subjugation to the domineering woman. Now back up one slide again. So as part of the way this cult worked, they built the temple of Artemis. This is kind of a, a, a rendering of, of this temple. It was bigger and grander than the pyramids. 
It was destroyed in the 200s, uh, obliterated from the face of the earth by the Goths. But uh, people said this was the, one of the most magnificent structures on planet earth at the time. And the temple Artemis was to uh, the Greek fertility goddess. So think about uh, what fertility means. Uh, you got women in charge of a giant temple in which they're worshiping sex. How do you think that's gonna go in this place? This place is way dysfunctional. So the apostle Paul goes, whoa, if there's any place that needs a church, we probably should put one next to that thing. <laughs> cause, cause that's pretty rough. And so he comes here and he begins to preach uh, Aquila and Priscilla preach here. Eventually the apostle John preaches here. Timothy preaches here. Mary moves here. They really try to see this place on planet earth turn into a place of faith. Date of writing is somewhere around 60 to 63 uh, AD is when he's writing this letter while he's in prison. And the big idea, this is what we're spending the rest of this message on, is be rich. Come on, say be rich. Look at the person next to you and say, you're richer than you think. And some of you are like, you don't know my bank account. You don't know what car I drive. You don't know what house I live in. Come on, say, I'm richer than I think. The first three chapters of Ephesians he's design, are designed to tell you about how wealthy you are in Christ. First three chapters are on the wealth of a believer. The next two chapters are on uh, the walk of a believer. And the last chapter is on the war of a believer. So we're going to talk about a, a believer's wealth today for just a minute. Come on, say, I'm wealthier than I think. This is Ephesians chapter one, verse three. Here's how, here's how he begins his letter to this crazy cult culture. He starts out with, I'll praise the God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with, what's the next three words? What are the three words? Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. I'm just asking the question, how many blessings does God have? All of them. And he said, they're all yours. That means the creator of the universe who owns it all has given it all to you. Come on, say, I own it all. You are richer than you think. You are wealthier. Now you're like thinking, you're thinking about cash, but there's way more important things than just money, yes or no? So here's what he's gonna describe what the wealth of a believer looks like. Between verses three and verse 14, here's what he says. He says, you are blessed, which means, and if you wanna write, I, I put all that list on here. If you wanna write down what each of those words mean, you're welcome to do it if you wanna, if you, you can if you want to. But blessed means God's hand's on you. You're not forgotten or abandoned. God's hand is on your life. You're chosen. Jesus picked you. Look at the person next to him and say, you're picked. Like you were picked from heaven to be part of his team if you wanna be. You're made holy. You're totally righteous. That's why we have a banner hanging over there. It's why we say every weekend, like you're, you're, you're not unrighteous. You're not a dirty, rotten sinner. You're a saint in the eyes of God. Is that good news? Yes. You're, you're uh, sorry, the next one, without blame. God's not mad at you. Oh, but you don't know what I did. You're without blame. He's not blaming you for the stuff you got wrong. Is that good news? Oh my gosh. You're adopted. You're in the royal family. You're, you're a prince or a princess of God most high. You have all the benefits and all the blessings of being, ro come on, say I'm royalty. You're adopted, you're accepted, you're welcomed. God put a, God's just really happy to see you. Every time, the, every time you pray, he's like, yay, they're talking to me. You're always welcomed. You're never put aside or ignored or in despair. You're beloved. You know what that means? You're his favorite. Come on, say, I'm his favorite. I'm his favorite. Look at the person next to you and just look deep in their eyes and be like, nope, I'm his favorite. <laughs> you, you are God's favorite. That's what the word beloved means. It means that you're special to him. You're redeemed. He, he bought you at a high price with the blood of his son. That's what, that's what redeemed means. It means to be purchased. You're forgiven. Your sin's never held against you. You're graced or favored. Uh, grace always means favor. So uh, that means he has more favor for you than he has for those out there. You are more, come on, say favor's not fair. As a believer, you have favor on your life that unbelievers do not have. God's always orchestrating things for your good. He's always adjusting things for your benefit. He's always figuring out ways to be so, so good to you. It's why he says he's chasing you down with goodness and mercy. Because you have more, come on, say I got more favor. You got more favor than those that do, that do not believe. You are enlightened with wisdom. That means you have the mind of Christ. You got the brain of Jesus inside you. You've been given an inheritance. All the wealth of heaven is yours. Everything that heaven has is already yours. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit, which means you got a helper and nobody, like unbelievers don't have a hel any help in this world. 
Unbelievers have, they, they do have some help. They have the internet. <laughs> Which could be good one minute and then burn you down the next, right? On the other hand, you have a perfect helper who never gets it wrong. When you ask him for wisdom, he always grants it. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit, this helper. And then lastly, you're guaranteed the inheritance of heaven. In other words, I can't, come on, say, I can't lose these blessings. If you are in Christ, you can't lose this stuff. It is who you are. My guess is a lot of Christians forget this is who they are and they walk around acting like they're poor and victimized and like I'm never gonna get ahead and it's not fair and I'm so freaking out about this and I'm so worried about that and I got this health issue, I got this. Dude, if you have all this stuff, do you have anything to worry about? But the devil's gonna tell you, you're on your own, you can't make it. Come on, say I'm richer than I think. There's an old story that I, I can't help but share with you of a family who wanted to immigrate from Europe to the US. And they saved and they saved and they saved until finally they had enough money to purchase a, a ticket on a boat to America. They got all their luggage together and they got everything they could take with them and a good supply of cheese and crackers and handed off the ticket and got on board the ship. Every night at dinner, they would hear about all the people going into the dining hall or the dining room to eat dinner and hang out and celebrate and eat together. And each night this family would try to encourage themselves and be like, hey, we, could, we only had enough money for the ticket. We can't go eat in there, but at least we got our cheese and crackers. At least we have something to eat. On the last night of the trip, the father said, you know what? Tomorrow we're arriving in New York City. We get to see the Statue of Liberty. You know, we, we, let's go celebrate. Let's go eat in the dining hall and just splurge for once. So they got to the dining hall and they began to eat and the food was awesome and the, and the wine was flowing and it was an incredible meal. And at the end of the meal, the father says to the, to the maitre d', hey, hey, how, how much do we owe you for all of this? And the maitre d' answered, what, what do you mean? This, the food and the drinks were free. It was included in the price of the ticket. And the family had been denying themselves and eating cheese and crackers throughout the entire trip when the food was always available and it had already been purchased and it was free for them to enjoy the entire trip. I wonder how many Christians have no idea how rich they are in Christ. And instead of enjoying all that God has for them, they're eating spiritual cheese and crackers, feeling like victims when they have all the riches of heaven available to them. Come on, say, I'm more rich than I think. You gotta stop walking around like you're broke and you're poor and everybody hates you and you're never gonna get ahead and you're all by yourself and nobody's paying attention. God wants to bless, God's favor is on your life. His hand is on your life. He's looking at you and going, man, I have so much more for you. Come on, say I'm richer than I think. Well, how, how did that all happen? Well, he explains that in, uh, by, by saying it's basically grace. Come on, say grace. In fact, the, the definition of grace, a simple, easy definition for grace is God's riches at Christ's expense, that all the blessings of heaven were given to you because Jesus paid the price. Ephesians chapter two, now we're in chapter two, says it this way, God saved you by his, God's riches at Christ's expense. That's how he saved you, when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. Come on, say it's a gift. You have been given royalty. You have been granted blessing. You have been given favor. It is, come on, say it's who I am. So stop walking around and complaining and whining and griping and being stressed and worried and trying to get your own way. You're so much better than that. You're blessed. Come on, say I'm richer than I think. Now, if it's true that you're richer than you think, maybe if you were in the royal family, you'd wanna walk worthy of that calling, yes or no? which is what the next two chapters in Ephesians are about. First three are about a believer's wealth. Chapters four and five are, five are about a believer's walk. In fact, he says this at the beginning of four. Hey, now that you know you're blessed, now that you know you're favored, now that you know that God's working all things for your good, that you got nothing to fear, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to, what are the next two words? Walk now walk worthy of this. If God's gonna grant you princess or prince status in the royal family, there's not only blessings, but there's also responsibilities. You need to live this out. Now, the question you might ask is, how do I live this out? And he talks about it a lot in chapter four. He talks about how you live out walking worthy by answering it by saying, just please listen to your leaders. Come on, say, listen to your leaders. It's not that leaders are domineering over you. If they are, they're jerks. 
It's not that they're trying to like tell you what to do and be all mean. It's like, oh my gosh, a leader in, a, in the local church is designed to make sure that you succeed and you live up to who you are in Christ. A healthy pastor or church leader is like, come on, you got more in you than you know. You're better than you think. You can accomplish more for the kingdom than you ever imagined. A, a good minister of the gospel is designed to be the coach and you to play on the field and accomplish more than you ever dreamed. And he writes it like this. This is why you listen to your leaders, not because they're trying to like lord it over to you, but because they actually have your best at heart. Just like a parent isn't it lording over a child, a parent has the child's best at heart if they're a good parent, yes or no? Yeah. Yes, that's how a church leader functions in the church. Now these are the gifts that God has given the church. Everybody say gifts. Yeah. So he's got some sort of gift to give to people to live out their calling, to live who they are in Christ, to live up to this expectation. What are the gifts? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. He basically says there's a whole bunch of leaders that are designed, that have been given to you by God so that you can elevate your life and live out who you are in the gospel. Then he says this, their responsibility, this is like my job, is to equip God's people to do the work. So the way I like to describe it is that I'm the coach and you're the players that the role of a pastor is I'm not the one on the field. Imagine for a second if you're watching the Vikings game next week uh, and, and all of a sudden the coach is like, I'm playing. And he's come run. Dude, that'd be a bad day for the Vikings, yes or no? No, coach stays on the sidelines and he coaches the players to work as a team to accomplish something awesome. And the reason why they're five and zero right now is because they're working well together as a team. They're listening to their coaches and the result is success, yes or no? In the same way, in the local church, the pastor's not the guy on the field or the girl on the field. They gotta stay off the field and coach you to win. They're going, you can do this. You can do more than you think. Okay, everybody, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna call a play, and I, 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 I need the wide receiver to cut left. And sometimes, on a bad team, wide receiver's like, I wanna go right. And they're about to get obliterated, yes or no? Oh man. A good pastoral coach is telling you go left because he's already seen too many people go right and he's seen their life just get burned down and obliterated and broken. And so he's like, please go left. Just listen to the words of your coach because if you just listen, God gave you pastors and teachers and evangelists and prophets and apostles so that you would elevate your life and walk. Come on, say walk worthy. Then he takes it from listen to your coaches a little bit further. And he's like, hey, what if we applied this all the way into your home? And he jumps into chapter five. And now he says, everybody say walk in love. So chapter four is we're gonna walk worthy by listening to healthy coaches. Chapter five, therefore be imitators of God as dear children. And there, there's the phrase, walk in love as Christ also has loved you and given himself for us. So you gotta ask the question, well then how do I walk in love? And the whole rest of, a, of chapter five is like, this is how you walk in love and the evidence that your home is truly a Christ-centered home is what he says next. This is 521, he says it like this. We're gonna all say it together. Further, what's the word? Ah! Isn't that like the grossest word in the English language? Who loves to submit? There's, no, there's never a hand up. I don't understand. He says, I want you to walk in love. Further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This applies to a church. This applies to a home. I'm gonna use Kelly as an example. So Kelly, come up for a second. So Kelly and I will have been married for 30 years in May. And the way that this marriage has stayed healthy for 30 years is honestly this verse right here, Ephesians 5.21, this advice from the Apostle Paul. He says, further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, remember the Ephesians culture. It is one group domineering over the other. And he goes, that's whack. That's going to mess you up. A healthy marriage is... A husband down on one knee for his whole life going, 
I prefer you. Everybody say, I prefer you. And then a wife in a healthy marriage. Back at you, bro. <laughs> I prefer you. And what you have right here is two people on their knees in reverence to Christ, each putting the needs of the other in he ahead of themselves. And what that's called is those two ugly words that aren't so ugly when you feel like this is how a marriage actually works, how it stays healthy. It's called, I would say mutual submission. Mutual submission. There's nobody doing this. Lord, but some of you are going, yeah, but, but, uh, but uh, I'll be a doormat. I'll be a, dude, here's what I'll tell you one of two things. Then that's really critical on who you marry. If you marry a jerk, you will be. If this bothers you, that, like, I, I can't possibly like go, I prefer you. I have to have my own way. I gotta make sure my needs are met. Don't get married. Right. Don't do it because you're gonna ruin your life and somebody else's. But on the other hand, if you're like, man, I prefer you, I love you, I wanna put your needs ahead of my own. I, I, I wanna make sure that you succeed, I wanna make sure you win, I, make sure, I wanna make sure that you thrive. Oh, what is, what is the marriage vow? In sickness and health, to love and to cherish, richer, per poorer, till death, do it's, it's mutual submission. Come on, say mutual submission. Both kneeling in honor of Jesus and you get something really beautiful, yes or no? Okay, then he's gonna take it further. And this is the verse that gets cherry picked by a lot of churches. Here's the very next verse after he says mutually submit out of reverence for Christ. The next verse is, for wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Then he brings up women being in submission, not before saying both of you equally submit. The next verse is, Women, this means you prefer your husband over yourself because you're gonna get something beautiful. Then he goes to the next verse, verse 25. He says, for husbands, this means love your wives as Christ loved the church. How did Jesus love the church? He gave up everything. Look at the phrase. He gave up his life for, notice he uses the, the female word to reference the church. He gave up every right every goal, he gave up everything for the church. He gave up everything. He was like, what was he doing? He's down on one knee at the cross, going, I prefer you, that you matter more. I'm gonna sacrifice myself for the good of the church. So the model of a good marriage is actually Jesus at the cross. It is a wife going, I prefer you. I'll sacrifice it all for your good. It's a husband going, I will sacrifice it all for your good. And what you get out of that, guys, when you stop fighting for your own way, when you submit in reverence to the Lord and love for each other, is you get something beautiful. I love being married. I love being married to her. I like being with her. We have something great. I'm always messed up when I'm not near her. She's great. <laughs> you know why? Because she says, I prefer you. And it makes me want to say, I prefer you. And together you get something very, very beautiful. If this is good news, make some noise. Also, she's pretty. <laughs> so he talks about uh, the wealth of a believer, the first three chapters, so you have nothing to fear. Then the, in chapter four, he's like, hey, just listen to your leaders so you walk worthy. Chapter five, he starts talking about, uh, 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 about how you walk in love, but he's not quite done with it because at the beginning of chapter six, he throws in one more thing for parents on how to walk in love towards their children. Now, the verse before, it talks about being obedient to your parents, but we, a lot of our kids are in kids' church, so I'm not talking about the obedience part. I'm just skipping to the next part of the phrase. So, uh, beginning of chapter six, Ephesians 6, 4, he says this, fathers or parents, do not provoke your kids to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So when you walk in Lord's love towards your kids, parents, you lead your kids to love Jesus. Now, I'm talking about it in just a second. If a domineering culture is dysfunctional, so is a domineering parent. My way or the highway, shut up kid, this is the way we're doing things, why? Because I told you so. Fine, <laughs> wham, door is slammed, right? You don't care about that kid's heart, you just care about their compliance. What you create in children is rebellion. So people talk a lot about teenage rebellion. It's a cultural cliche. I think it's a lie and a cop-out by parents. 
I think if you got teenage rebellion, you have parental dysfunction. I'm not trying to be mean, but the goal of a parent is to call out the heart of a child, not to just get compliance in the moment. It's not my way or the highway. It's, hey, we're choosing this route because this way is better in faith. And you're teaching them the why. Like when they're little, when they're three and four and five, obviously you're just giving them rules and telling them they got to have consequences and blah, blah, blah. But by the time they're teenagers, you better be starting talking to them about, about why we do the things we do. Because you're trying to call out the heart of your child. And there's a difference between outward compliance and interchange in the heart. Yes or no? And so I spent a lot of my kids' teenage years in parenting sitting on the end of their bed for hours. Dad, that's not fair. How come, I, how come it's not fair? And I would just sit there and they would be miserable and I would be miserable and we're just gonna keep working it through. And I'm not leaving, I'm not leaving the room with the slam door. It doesn't happen. If the slam door happens, I am following them in because I'm after their heart. I care about their soul. And so then I'm sitting on the end of the bed and going, what's going on? What's going on? Let's talk about this. Let's keep, let's keep. and I'm trying to pull out of them why they're frustrated. And then I'm trying to talk about why Jesus is greater and why Jesus is better and how he's the only one. And I just kept working with them lovingly until I could pull out of them this tension. And they were back to a place of health. See, this is healthy parenting and nobody teaches us this guys my guess is all of us we all have flawed parents and a lot of times what you heard was it's my way or the highway and you were like fine and you're slamming doors so then when it was your turn to be a parent you spoke the same way and you create in your children anger and rebellion and you got to chase after their heart like God chased after yours and what you will get is something beautiful. And so he says, do not provoke your kids to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up in the discipline and the instruction that comes from the Lord. Or in other words, you're preferring their heart and you're pulling out of them something so awesome so that they succeed long term. This is healthy parenting. Are you still with me? So let's see. Chapters one through three. Come on, say I'm richer than I think. Chapters four was walk worthy. Come on, say walk worthy. Chapter five was walk in love. Come on, say walk in love. And then you get to chapter six, which is a believer's war. Come on, say win your war. Win your war. He's got one more final thing to say. He's like, hey, just so you know, everybody, like, hey, this is kind of how he rolls it. If you're richer than you think, you got nothing to fear. If you'll walk worthy, you're gonna elevate your life. If you love each other well, your home life is gonna succeed. And then he goes, don't forget, whatever you do, don't forget this is not a playground, this is a battlefield. If you believe this world is a playground, how much money can I get? How much stuff can I own? How much joy can I get out of all my junk? This is a battlefield, not a playground. So you have an enemy who has been scoping out your life since the moment you exist. The red dot has been on your back since the moment, moment you came to breathing air. And he came to steal and kill and destroy. And he has whispered, run after stupid stuff. Waste your life on junk and on this and on that. Go after pleasure and stupid things. Yay! And you don't realize you're in a landmine and all of a sudden a leg gets blown off or a child gets hurt or a marriage falls apart or because you've forgotten that this is, this is, you are not ever on a playground until you get to eternity. You've been put behind enemy lines. There's never a moment where there's not a battle for your soul going on. Right now, angels and demons are fighting over your life. Your soul matters so much. Jesus went to the cross to make sure that he could rescue you from hell and put you into the kingdom of light. Come on, say, win your war. And here's how he describes it. This is, I got one final word for all y'all that know you're rich now. I know God's taking care of you. Here's his final word. Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor. Everybody say all. all. 
so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. I'm going to talk more about this on Wednesday if you want to, if you want to come. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor. Come on, say every piece. So you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you'll still be standing up and not blown up. So he says, stand your ground, put on the belt of truth. Guys, I don't do this once. I do it literally every morning. As part of my morning routine, I put on, Lord Jesus, I put on the belt of truth. Help me be a person of integrity today. Help me not stretch the truth. Help me not lie. Help me not adjust the truth. No little white lies. Help me be a person of integrity all the way through. I put on the belt of truth because you're true. I pray it out every day. I put on the body armor of God's righteousness. So I put on the breastplate of his righteousness. You know what that is? One translation says the breastplate of God's approval. God's proud of me. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I didn't make myself righteous. He made me righteous. May I not forget that I, I am God's righteousness. May I guard my heart so I'm not discouraged or start to feel like a lousy human being because you've made me righteous. So guard my heart today. I put on the shoes of the gospel of peace. So Lord Jesus, today, I put on the shoes of peace. I pray that every situation that I walk into, I'd walk into it like the Prince of Peace. I pray that today, that if there's conflict, that I would be the reconciler, that I would bring peace to troubled souls, that when people try to fight, that I'm not gonna fight with them. I'm gonna be gracious towards them. I'm gonna be a person of kindness and peace and gentleness because it's who you are as the Prince of Peace. I walk in the shoes of peace. I pray it every day. Put on the shoes of peace that come from the, the good news so you'll be able to be full, fully prepared in addition to all this. Hold up the shield of faith. What's the shield of faith? The shield of the faith is that you believe that God's taking care of everything and you have nothing to worry about. You're holding that, like, because your circumstances are gonna suck. Bad things are gonna happen, yes or no? So you, every day you're grabbing the shield of faith and going, no, no, God's working everything for good. God's gonna take care of this situation. God's got this all under control. I can trust that he's taking good care of me. You're picking up his shield of faith so that when bad things happen, you're still trusting him through it. to stop all the fiery darts of the evil one. Put on the salvation or salvation as your helmet. Every day I say, Lord Jesus, I, I put on the helmet of salvation, protect my mind today. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that I have the mind of Christ. It's already in me. You've already given me more wisdom than I'll ever even know. So help me use your wisdom for your glory and honor today. I have the helmet of salvation. And I take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So today, Lord Jesus, I grab this word. I'm gonna read a little piece of this because I'm gonna need this in order to fight on this battlefield. I gotta know this word. Lord, help me remember this all throughout my day as I study your word. And then the last thing he says in this text is he says, pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. And I, 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 this is, remember, this is a battlefield prayer. So think about a, a guy who's behind enemy lines and he's losing and he thinks he, thinks he, might, go, he, he might not make it. So he picks up his radio and he calls in an airstrike. And last way, I'm only way I'm gonna make this, calls in an airstrike, all of a sudden enemy, enemy lines just obliterated. And the chance for him to succeed is because he radioed for help. That's what prayer is. It is why you're praying in the spirit on all occasions. You're praying out, God, I need you to call in a strike. I need you to fix this thing. I need you to adjust that. I need, and maybe the situation doesn't change, but you change because you trusted him. Guys, this isn't a once in a while prayer I'm going through. I think Ephesians chapter six is the greatest chapter in the New Testament for your spiritual success. So every, here's how it goes for me. I, I just start with the top of my head. Lord Jesus, today I put on the helmet of salvation, protect my mind, help me have uh, pure, clean thoughts, help me be honorable in the way I think. Thank you that I have the mind of Christ and the wisdom of Christ for everything that I need. I put on the breastplate of God's righteousness. Thank you that you're proud of me and that you're speaking life over me and that you've got good plans for me. I put on the belt of truth. Today, Lord Jesus, help me be honorable and a person of integrity in everything I say because you're the, you're the person of truth. I put on the shoes of peace. Today, make me a peacemaker. Help me bring reconciliation to every situation. I pick up the sword of the spirit, uh, which is the word of God. May I use your word today. Remind me of your word so that I can succeed. I pick up the shield of faith, and when circumstances look bad, I'm gonna trust that they're good. See how fast I just pray that? It's because I've been praying it for years, every day. Now, imagine a Christian who isn't praying any of this. You just left your house every morning naked on a battlefield. <laughs> Heaven's like, you see that naked kid? He got blown up again. 
And so he tells you, it's a battlefield. Come on, say, win your war. You can win the war. He's already given you all the weapons, but it's not a playground. And you gotta put on some clothes or you're gonna get blown up. And then you walk out the door and you're more likely to win in this horrible thing called life. Wealth, walk, war. Wrap it up. I'm just gonna, we're just gonna apply it three ways. Super simple, wealth. Did you forget how rich you are? Why are you living like a pauper? Why are you living so worried? Why are you living so stressed? Why are you freaking out all the time? Why are you trying to fight for your own way? You have everything you need in Christ. In fact, this is Luke chapter 12, verse 32. Now I'm not talking about the apostle Paul. Now I'm giving you the words of Jesus himself. He says, do not fear little flock for it is your father's good pleasure to give you what? God's a happy God who wants to give you everything. So why are you so angry? Why are you so bitter? Why are you so afraid? What is the thing that keeps stressing you out or keeps making you mad or keeps bothering you? We're in an election season. So many people so mad and so stressed over who's gonna win the election. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Stop freaking out. He's in charge, yes or no? But people in fear then live fearful. Oh, what, is, what did the great theologian Yoda say? Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to the, come on, come on, nerds. <laughs> yeah. See, fear is how we get up, uh, end up in all of the stress and the pain and the conflict and the, everything goes back to fear. And so Jesus tells you, you, come on, say, I have nothing to fear. First John says, perfect love drives out fear. Stop being so afraid. Stop being so worried. He loves you. You're taken care of. You're not forgotten or abandoned. He's holding your hand. He's never quitting on you. Come on, say, I'm gonna be all right. Second, walk. Would you please just walk worthy of your calling? Would you just walk in who God made you to be? It's the simplest thing ever. Just listen to your leaders. They really don't want you blown up. Love your spouse sacrificially because he or she is worth it. Lead your kids to love Jesus, not just get compliance out of them. And then lastly, war. Please win your war. Put on your armor, come on, say every day. Every day you put on your armor, every day. Helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, belt of truth, shoes of peace, shield of faith, sword of the spirit. Why? Because I'm not walking out into this world naked. I don't want to lose again. Because it's not a playground, it's a battlefield. Now I know we just finished the notes and so set them all down. That's fine, just cool, set them down. I want to say one more thing. If you didn't hear anything else I said, I want you to hear this thing. That's why I want you to set it down. If we're on a battlefield, that means right now at 1222 in the afternoon, angels and demons are fighting over your soul. You were not here by accident or chance today. Some of you didn't even expect to come here this morning, but you did. And it's because angels and demons are fighting over your soul and heaven is trying to pull you into something beautiful and good. And hell is still is trying to steal your joy and ruin your marriage and destroy your kids and break up your heart and antagonize your soul. And you gotta choose what side you're gonna join. Because it's really a war. Like right now, you are in an actual battle. It's not fake, it's not pretend, and it doesn't ever quit until you get to eternity. And so you gotta choose. Jesus, life, faith, strength, joy, peace, hope, victory, brokenness, anger, anxiety, worry, stress, depression. I can never figure out what the downside is of following Jesus, but people keep ignoring him and flipping him off anyway. Choose well, because this is war. Can you just close your eyes and bow your head for just a second?
I don't know where you're at on your faith journey. I don't know what you're facing, but you do got to choose. Right now, when you walk out this door, you're going to be on one side or the other. Scripture says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you're saved. He rescues you from darkness and takes you to the kingdom of light. So I'm going to lead us on a, in a prayer, and I want the demons to hear which side you're choosing. I want angels and demons to know which side of this war you're on and who your hope and strength is in. So all over this room, just out loud, everybody just pray, Jesus Christ, today I choose you. Thank you that you forgive my sins. Thank you that you bless my life. Thank you that you're working for my good. Thank you that I have nothing to fear. You alone are my savior and God. Take me to my destiny and help me win my war today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey guys, thank you so much for joining us on the Free Grace United YouTube channel today. I hope you got something awesome out of the message. If you would go ahead and hit that subscribe button down below just to stay up to date with all of the sermons and talks that we have coming up around here, that would be super awesome. Also, go ahead, uh, leave a like or a comment below as well. Maybe comment uh, what you got out of the message, where you're watching from, uh, or if there's any way that we can join you in prayer this next week. We'd love to help you out. Also, if you're looking for any other opportunities to get plugged in at Free Grace United, whether that be giving or serving or anything like that, just head on over to freegrace.tv and it'll have all the answers for you. Thank you so much for watching with us today. We hope to see you next week and let's end this service the way that we always do, which is with Psalm 67, one and two. God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us that his way may be known on earth, his saving power among all nations. God bless you. We love you. Have a great week.